Good afternoon. Oh. Well, thank you. I hope that I deserve that after the session is over, so thank you very much. So how has the conference been so far? Has it been good? Yeah, good. Well, guess, good. <laughs> well, we're going to try to make it even better. How about that? So I'm going to try to do something maybe a little bit unusual today. You know, you go to conferences, you attend conference sessions, you learn new things, which is all very good. Uh, and I'm going to teach you some new things, but I also want to try to change your life just a little bit. Because what I'm going to present uh, is, I believe, life-changing. It's going to make a difference in your life as a software developer. Now, maybe you will disagree with me when we're done, but hopefully you will walk out of here feeling as if you were a slightly different person and hopefully a better person than when you walked in. My name is Jeff Proceis, and the title of this talk is uh, Building ML and AI Applications in C-Sharp, Introduction to ML.NET. So before we talk about ML.NET, let's talk about machine learning and AI just a little bit. I would submit to you that about every 10 years, our industry and our lives undergo a sea change that literally changes the way we do what we do. In the 1980s, back when I graduated from college and started working in this industry, it was the PC revolution that not only changed what you and I do for a living, but, but changed everyday lives as well. In the 1990s, it was the internet, which fundamentally changed the way we live our lives and the way we write software. In the 2000s, believe it or not, it was the introduction of the smartphone. How often do you sit in a restaurant now, or in a subway, a metro, you look around you and everyone is on their smartphone, right? It's hard to believe 20 years ago how much that technology would change what we do today. I believe that we're at the cusp of another revolution that is just as fundamental as those, and that is the revolution around machine learning and artificial intelligence, better known as AI. Now, I'm not going to try to turn you into data scientists. There are very smart people in Microsoft Research and Google and Facebook and elsewhere. They make a lot of money. They have PhDs in data science. Their job is to build sophisticated neural networks, come up with new neural network architectures and things like that. That's not what we're here for. In my past life, before I became a software developer, I was an aerospace engineer. Aerospace engineers don't think great thoughts. Physicists do that. They come up with the laws and the equations, but engineers apply those laws and equations to solving everyday problems and business problems. As a software developer, that's your job in the world of ML and AI, not to come up with new neural network architectures, but to understand what these things are, to be familiar with the tools and the technologies that let you use them to solve business problems. And that's why ML.NET is fundamentally important, I believe, in the life of a .NET developer. If you wanted to start building machine learning models and AI models a few years ago, there was basically one way to do it. You learned Python. One reason for that is Python is the most popular language for data science, for machine learning, for AI. Uh, and part of the reason for that is the folks that build those models, those that work in academia and for the tech giants, for the most part, they used Python in grad school. That's what they're most comfortable with. Another reason that Python is so big in this community is that most of the, not most of, many of the cutting edge, state of the art libraries out there for building ML and AI models are Python libraries. Libraries like Scikit and Keras and PyTorch and others. I started dealing with ML and AI in a big way about five years ago. I think I'd written maybe 10 lines of Python code in my life up to that point. So I, I learned Python and I started doing a lot of work in Python and learning those libraries. A and the whole time I was doing that, I was wishing that I could do all of this in C Sharp because guess what? I'm a .NET developer. I love C Sharp. I prefer it over any other language, and when I use Python, it's only because I have to. Unfortunately, until recently, we C-sharp developers did not have a world-class ML library that we could use. That changes with ML.NET. 
ML.NET is Microsoft's free and open source library for building sophisticated ML and AI models. We're going to look at a lot of examples today, and I'm going to give you the URL of a, a GitHub repo where all of the examples are posted, maybe even some that we don't cover, so you can play with these on your own. But the big message is that we finally have a great way to build ML and AI models in C Sharp. Now, that's significant for a number of reasons. One, I don't have to learn Python to do this kind of stuff anymore. Number two, operationalizing a model built with a Python library like Scikit uh, or Keras or another is difficult for a C-sharp developer. There are different strategies we use for doing it. A very common way uh, is we containerize that Python machine learning model uh, along with a Flask web server. We expose REST endpoints that we can call on a container and we call those from C-sharp, but that's highly inefficient. If you and I as C-sharp developers are going to build intelligence into our apps using ML and AI, we want to be able to do that natively. We write our code in C-sharp, we want to build the models in C-sharp as well. No tricks with containers or Flask web servers or anything like that. Build the model, train it, serialize it, bring it into our code and use it, and that's exactly what ML.NET allows us to do. Now, here's something interesting about ML.NET. It's really not that new. It's only seen the light of day in recent months, but it's been floating around in Microsoft for almost 10 years now. No one at Microsoft woke up one morning and said, you know what, we better build an ML and AI library. This thing had been inside Microsoft, used internally in hundreds of its products for several years, and it had evolved. A lot of the code inside it was written by folks who worked for Microsoft Research. Unfortunately, the code wasn't very pretty, wasn't very presentable. Uh, even if you worked at Microsoft and had access to the library, using it in a product was very difficult because there was no common architecture. You ended up writing all sorts of wrappers and stuff just to get the things to work. Three years ago, a small team of people at Microsoft had the idea of taking that library, cleaning it up, making it fit for public consumption, and open sourcing it. It took them almost a year to convince Microsoft management to do it, but they finally relented, and the product is ML.NET. The core of ML.NET are the same sophisticated machine learning and AI algorithms that are used in a lot of different Microsoft products. But now they've been cleaned up, they've been documented, they've all been given a common API so that you and I can use them. So with that, we're going to start exploring ML.NET. If you've never seen it before, I want you to go away from this session with a very solid idea of how we build and train and then operationalize machine learning models with it so that you can then use it in your own projects. So let's pop out of PowerPoint here for a moment. And let's go into Visual Studio. So the first sample I'm going to look at is one called, and looks like it somehow got deleted. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, well, I guess, uh, you know what, uh, <laughs> we'll just look at the next one instead. So, if problem is if I go to GitHub now and sync up, it's going to delete it there as well. In fact, it probably already has. There's supposed to be a project there called MLN Simple Regression, uh, and I'll bet it's not in my recycle bin either. So what I can do is go to GitHub, go back in time there, pull it out. Uh, we'll just go on to the next one, uh, and I'll cover everything in the next demo that I was going to do in this one. So let's go back to the slides for just a moment. Actually, let's see, there's a secret place. I may have a backup copy of it. Let's see. You never know, right? And no, it's not there either. I don't want to take five minutes to go resurrect it from GitHub. So uh, when you go to GitHub, you'll see an additional project there called Simple Linear Regression, just showing the bare bones basics. But again, we'll cover that in the next demo. So. One of the things, one of the first things that you should know about in ML.NET, and you'll see this in the code, is something called the data view. If any of you have done ML programming in Python, you've probably used a library called Pandas. Pandas has a very useful data structure called the data frame, and it's very common for us to read data from some data source, read it into a data frame, manipulate the data there, clean the data in various ways. 
uh, and then ultimately use the contents of that data frame to train a machine learning model. One of the core constructs in ML.NET is something called the data view. It's simply an object that implements an interface named iDataView. It is the ML.NET equivalent of a pandas data frame, but it is in many ways much more powerful than a data frame. One of the things that the ML.NET team wanted to do was not only build a library that would train models much faster than conventional libraries like uh, uh, Scikit, but that would also scale so that when you run it on a machine with multiple cores or on an HPC cluster that has multiple processors with multiple cores, so that we would get near linear scaling of the training time. Another thing that they wanted to do was allow us to deal with massively large data sets that, sets that Python simply cannot handle. Those are the big reasons that they created the data view. In the early days of this library, as they were cleaning it up and building it out, they began with an I enumerable. But they quickly ran into a, a number of limitations. One is the contents of an I enumerable have to fit in memory. But sometimes in, in data science, we deal with data sets that are much too large to fit in memory. Another thing is, it turned out the .NET type system wasn't quite robust enough. It wasn't detailed enough for what they wanted to do inside their data views. For example, we need the ability not only to say that a column contains a bunch of integers, but that the range of those integers might be constrained, say, from values to 0 to 10. All of that led the ML.NET team to create something called the data view. They took inspiration from SQL databases. You create a data view. There's essentially no limit on its size because it is cursorable. Uh, they only bring into memory as much as they need to at one time. It is lazily evaluated as well. Nothing happens inside the, the pipeline that uses this data view until you actually train the model, which I'll show you how to do in a few moments. That does mean that when you're debugging, sometimes it's a little frustrating because you have pulled a bunch of data into a data view, you've done some transform on it, and then if you step in, in the debugger and look at the contents of that data view, there's nothing there because it's lazily evaluated. So in working with data views, one of the most important methods that you, know, you can learn about is one called preview. It inhibits performance, so you only want to use it when you're debugging, but you can insert a call to preview on a data frame into your code, set a breakpoint on it, and that will cause that data frame to be evaluated at that time. So now in the debugger, you can step in, you can see the results of the transforms or whatever else you did to the data that you had loaded into that data view. Now, one of the things that you can do with the data view is load data into it. It's very common in machine learning to get data from CSV and TSV files. Therefore, the team built in some easy to use methods like the ones you see right here to allow us to load up a data view from the contents of a CSV file or a TSV file. There are different options there allowing you to say, uh, tell it whether to ignore quotes if there are quotation marks in there and things like that. Basically, anything you might run into uh, in terms of how a TSV or CSV is formatted they have anticipated through options that you can leverage on the load from text file method. Now that doesn't mean the CSV and TSV files are the only places where you can grab data for a data view. It's very common for us to grab them from a database like an Azure SQL database or a MySQL database or something like that. The way we load up a data view with data that doesn't come from a TSV or a CSV file is shown here. You call, <clears throat> excuse me, a method named load from enumerable, and you pass it in an I enumerable. Now, the contents of that I enumerable may be something that you crafted up in memory, as I'm doing in the simple example, or it may be a million rows that you retrieve from a database query. Once you have it in an I enumerable, you can then load it into a data frame using the load from enumerable method. So in the various examples that we look at, you'll see me mostly loading the data from, from TSV and CSV files, but realize that you can load that data from anywhere. In addition to giving you methods to load data into a data frame, ML.NET also gives you methods for using the data frame to prepare the data. If you've worked with ML before, you know that in the real world, data is usually pretty rough. Generally, it requires quite a lot of massaging and preparing, uh, even transforming. If 
fundamentally changing before it's fit to train a machine learning model. Uh, just one classic example is a process called normalization. When you are training a machine learning model with columns of values that vary greatly in magnitude, in, in the worst case, that can keep the model during the training time from converging on a solution. Uh, in the best case, it's probably going to take it longer to train than it should and may reduce the model's final accuracy. So one thing we often do when we train machine learning models is normalize the data. There are various ways to normalize data. For example, there's something called standardization or standard normalization, where you take all these values in a column which may range from something very small to something very large, and you squash them down to basically values between negative one and one. Uh, uh, you compute from those values uh, a mean. You subtract the mean uh, from all the values so that they have a base of zero. Then you build one standard deviation around that. Very standard fair in data science. The reason I mention that is mil.net gives us methods for doing that, doing it very easily. Basically, one line of code lets me do min-max normalization, standard normalization, almost any kind of normalization that data scientists do. I've got a few examples right here of just some of the things you can do with a data view to manipulate the data. It's very common, for example, when we pull in a bunch of data with which we want to train a machine learning model to find out that there are some rows with missing values in them. Generally speaking, missing values are bad for a machine learning model. So there are a couple of approaches that we take to fix that. The simple one is to remove rows with missing values. And guess what? There's a method in data view for doing that. Uh, sometimes we'll replace those values, if they're numeric values, with values that are the mean uh, of the other values in the column. All of those things that you might want to do. Um, remove rows with missing values, remove columns with missing values, fill in missing values with mean values. All those sorts of things are all built in to ML.NET. One of the most important methods that you'll use when you use ML.NET is one called train test split. By the way, if you have experience with Scikit, you'll notice that some of these methods have the same names as the equivalent methods in Scikit. The team uh, not only was inspired by Scikit, they also built a Python wrapper around this so that Python programmers can use a Scikit API to train ML.NET models and take advantage of greater scalability, multiple cores, higher performance, and things like that. Train test split is fun fundamentally important for this reason. When you train a machine learning model, if you don't test it, if you don't validate it, you have no idea how accurately that model can make predictions. Which means when we train a machine learning model, we really want to have two data sets, one for training it with, and we like to have a completely separate data set for testing it. And sometimes we get lucky, and we find a source of data that has both a training set and a test set. More often, we only have one data set. So what we do is we split it into a training set and a test set. We typically do an 80-20 split, although some people prefer to do a 60-40 split or a 50-50. ML.NET's train test split function takes a data view and splits it into two data views for you so that you can use one of them for training and one of them for testing. You'll see that in virtually every one of my examples, except for those in which I have both a training set and a test data set from the start. Once you have the data that you want to train the machine learning model loaded into your data view, and you have the data prepared, you've done whatever you need to do to it, normalization of values, remove missing values, et cetera, and you're ready to train the model, the way you do that in ML.NET is by bringing in one of its trainer uh, methods. These are actually classes, not methods, um, although they're invoked with um, uh, methods that actually create an instance of the class. Now, in the machine learning world, there are two general types of problems. There are regression problems, and there are classification problems. There are a few others, but those constitute 99.99% of what we call the supervised learning problems, the ones in which we're training a machine learning model in order to do predictive analytics. One of the reasons Scikit is so popular in the data science world is that it takes the various learning algorithms that data scientists have come up with over the years, 
algorithms like support vector machines, random forest, decision trees, uh, ordinary least squares regression, and it hides those behind a simple function call. ML.NET does the same. By using these training classes, you're leveraging the work of Microsoft Research and others at Microsoft who over the years have coded up and refined these algorithms. Now, if you're building a regression model, and just as a reminder, a, a regression model is one in which you expect a numeric output. So for example, if you're going to take the a bunch of data and try to predict with the machine learning model the price of a house or how long it will be before a car needs service or something like that, you're looking for a numeric output. That means you'll be building a regression model, which in ML.NET means that you'll use one of its regression trainers. Now, some of these may look familiar to you. For example, OLS stands for Ordinary Least Squares. It is the simplest and most fundamental type of regression. When you take a class on machine learning, they always start with simple linear regression using Ordinary Least Squares. If that's the algorithm you want to use to train this model, it's right there. But there are other much more sophisticated algorithms as well. Now, I won't attempt to go through each of these describing it. I will say, one of the nice things about ML.NET is that they've done a pretty darn good job of documenting the algorithms that are used in these classes. So if you want the gut-level details that a data scientist would be looking for in trying to help you choose an algorithm, if you go to the online docs, for the most part, those details are there. So here's a quick example of, of something I might do to build a regression model, something a little bit more complete than what I would have shown you in that first demo. I'm taking a data view containing data I've loaded from somewhere, and I'm doing an 80-20 split so that I'll be using 80% of the data to train the model and 20% to evaluate the model to see how accurate it is at making predictions after I've trained it. I then create a pipeline. This is the first step once you have your data view loaded in training a model in ML.NET. Notice that in that pipeline, I begin by calling context.transforms.concatenate. Now, you didn't see this in the first example because I didn't show you that example. But the first line of code in every ML.NET app is one that creates an object of type ML context. Uh, that object does several things for you, not the least of which is it has various properties that give you access to all of the ML.NET APIs. So in this example, that context uh, variable in the first line is an instance of the ML context class that I've created probably in the line previous to that. And through its data property, I'll call train test split to do the 80 20 split on the data. Then I, uh, through the transforms property of the ML context object, I call concatenate. Now, this is interesting and it's something you need to understand because this concept does not exist in scikit or in other uh, machine learning libraries. When we train a machine learning model, we typically have a table. The table has rows and it has columns. Typically, we designate one of those columns as the label column. That's the one containing the values whose outputs we intend to predict with the ML model. All of the other columns are the so-called feature columns. Those are the ones that um, during training, the model is actually looking at to try to, to build a relationship between the values it sees there and the values it sees in the label column. The way ML.NET does this is it has you call this concatenate method to create in your data view a column named features. And in that call, you specify all of the columns in the data view that you want to be included in that features column. Now, those are optional. If you simply want to include all of the columns in the data view, you can leave off those extra parameters. But in this case, I'm saying take the columns named call one, call two, and call three, whatever they are, and those are the ones that are my so-called feature columns. Those are the ones that I want the model to look at during training. Once I've done that, I then need to apply a learning algorithm to it. So once more, I go through my ML context object, this time through the regression.trainers property, and I call the fast forest method, which creates an instance of a, uh, a class named fast forest uh, regression trainer that will do fast forest regression. Now, 
Fast forest regression is basically a, a super sophisticated random forest slash decision tree based algorithm. Uh, one of the nice things about those algorithms, if you've dealt with this before, is that you don't have to normalize the data going into it. Um, so, in this case, you don't see any code that does normalization. Once I've done that, I'm ready to train the model. That happens when I call fit on the pipeline. I pass in the training data. Up into that time, the code executes very quickly because nothing is really being done other than a pipeline being assembled. Once I call fit, it could go away for a little while. If it's a small data set with a thousand values, it's probably going to be a second or two. Um, if it's a data set containing 500 million rows, it's going to take a while to do that training. That's why when data scientists deal with really massive data sets like that, they don't, they don't train those on laptops. They spin up HPC clusters in Azure or AWS equipped with GPUs, and they do the training there so that they can take advantage of massive parallelism. At any rate, it's when you call fit that the model gets trained. When you call any of those methods that, that identify a training algorithm, like the fast forest method in the previous slide, you can accept all of the default uh, parameters for that method, or options as they're called in ML.NET, or you can specify your own. Now, if you've worked with scikit before, you know that when you call a scikit function that uh, uh, essentially enacts a learning algorithm, those functions typically take anywhere from five to 20 different parameters that affect how that algorithm learns from the data. The same is true here. All of these methods that create trainer classes give you sensible defaults, but through a process called hyperparameter tuning, uh, by which we try to find the optimal set of parameters or options that go with that learning algorithm to produce the best results, uh, we can often increase the accuracy of the model. This pattern that you see right here, where if I want to use something other than the defaults with, in this case, the fast forest method, I create an options object and fill in all of the options is one that is used consistently throughout ML.NET. In Scikit, they use optional function parameters. In ML.NET, we use options object that can be passed into the method that creates the um, uh, class that implements the learning algorithm. Now, I'm going to get to this next example in just a moment, but let me prepare you for a couple of more things you're going to see. As I said earlier, you can train a model all you want. Until you evaluate it, until you test it, you really don't know if it's going to do what you want to do. In a lot of libraries, there's a lot of code required to evaluate the model. ML.NET makes it really, really easy. Um, you'll see this in the code, but basically, if I'm building a regression model, one that's designed to produce a numeric output in ML.NET, it gives me access <coughs> excuse me, to an object with properties that reflect all of the different metrics that data scientists typically use to evaluate regression models. Uh, very, one very popular one is one called R-squared. It basically takes a regression model, evaluates it, gives you a, a, a value between zero and one. Uh, zero means the model's not very accurate at all. One means it's really, really accurate. And typically what we shoot for is something in, in the 0.8 to 0.9 range. There are other metrics that data scientists sometimes use to evaluate regression models as well. Um, mean squared error, for example, and mean absolute error. Whatever metric you want to use, it's given to you by ML.NET. You simply make a method call to the evaluate method, as you see in this code snippet. It goes and does that, and then it comes back to you with the results. Now, something else that data scientists tend to be very diligent about doing, or at least should be, is something called cross-validation. So it's very, very common to take a data set, do essentially a random split on it, so that you have two data sets, one for training and one for testing. But here's the problem with that. Depending on which 20% of the rows you randomly pull out to do the evaluation, you will typically get different results. So what data scientists typically do is enact something called cross-fold validation, also known as k-fold validation. They will take that 80-20 split, and they will do it five times, so that basically they're, they're, they're evaluating the model 
five different times. It does take five times longer to execute, by the way, each time with a, di a different 20% of the da data set being used to evaluate and a different 80% being used to train. Then they take the mean of the R squared scores or other scores that they get for all of those five folds, and that gives them a more accurate picture of how well this model is able to do predictions. Once more, ML.net makes that incredibly easy. Instead of calling the evaluate method as I did in the previous slide, this time I call the cross-validate method uh, on my model. I tell it how many folds I want it to use to do the cross-validation. It doesn't go so far as to give me the mean of the R-squared scores, but it does give me the R-squared score for each fold, uh, which I can now, with one line of code, take the mean of and get a more accurate picture of the accuracy of my model. One more thing I want to prepare you for before we do this next demo. How many of you are familiar with the term one-hot encoding? Has anyone heard that before? See a few hands go up. So one-hot encoding is really, really important because, for the most part, machine learning models can only deal with numbers. They deal with zeros and ones and floating point values in between. And yet, a lot of the models that we build around machine learning contain textual values in them. Sometimes these values are what we call categorical values. Maybe there's a column in our data set that represents the make of a car, a BMW, an Audi, or something else. Well, you and I can look at that and say that's BMW or Audi, but a machine learning model does not know what those characters mean. To fix that, in order to use those so-called categorical variables uh, in a machine learning model, we use a process called one-hot encoding. We basically add new columns to the data view, one per unique value in that column of categorical values. Then, uh, in those extra columns, we assign uh, uh, values of one or zero based on whether that value in that row existed in the original data set. That's called one cut encoding. It takes one line of code to do in Scikit. It takes one line of code to do in ML.NET as well. If you've never dealt with this before, the purpose of one hot encoding is when you have a data set that has categorical values, typically textual values, that an ML model doesn't know how to deal with, one hot encoding basically turns those categorical values into additional columns of zeros and ones that a model can consume. Now, let me try to make this a little bit more concrete by showing you some code. And this one, I did not delete. So we're going to look at a regression model in ML.NET. We're going to see basically everything we've talked about up to now in code. So let me start by showing you the data set. This is a data set that comes from Zillow, the online real estate company. Um, they make a lot of their data public. It's actually very useful for building and testing machine learning models. This particular data set is simply a CSV file. Contains, I think, a few hundred rows. Uh, yep, 440. Uh, that's not nearly big enough, probably, to produce a super accurate model, but it does allow me to do the training on a dual core laptop pretty quickly. Each row of the data set contains information about a property that is sold in a, in a neighborhood of San Francisco in the United States. Uh, each row contains information like um, the size of the dwelling in square feet, how many bedrooms it has, how many bathrooms it has. And in particular, one of the columns is called last sold price. This is how we know how much that particular dwelling sold for the last time it was sold. And our goal now is to predict how much a dwelling will sell for based on the parameters we input, based on what was learned from this data. So let's go over to program.cs. This is a .NET Core console application. And I want to start at the bottom. One of the things I like a lot about ML.NET and about C Sharp in general is strong typing. When you're dealing with uh, Python and Pandas data frames, if you make a typing error, you know what happens. You certainly don't get a compile time warning because those things don't get compiled. You learn about it at runtime, and sometimes it's really hard to figure out what you did wrong. With ML.NET, 
We define what the input to a machine learning model is going to look like and what the output is going to look like using strong typing. Look what I've done here. I've defined a class named input. It doesn't matter what the name is. I just chose input, so it would be obvious when you look at it that I'm going to use it as input to train a machine learning model. You can call it anything you want. But I'm defining several properties in here that, uh, whose names come from uh, the names in, of the columns in the data set. And with this load column attribute, I'm telling ML.NET which column in that CSV file these values should come from. More importantly, I take one of the columns and I attribute it column name label. Remember, label is the term used in machine learning for the column of values that we're going to try to predict. This is how I, how I tell ML.NET that I want you to use all of these other columns essentially as feature columns. When I ask you to do a prediction with this model, I want you to predict a value for the last sold price column. For the output, when I ask it to do a prediction, it's going to output a numeric value representing last sold price. So I define a class named output. I define a single, a, a single um, property, actually not even a property, uh, uh, um, uh, named price. I can name that anything that I want. But really important is the attribute attached to it, column name score. Generally speaking, I don't like programming libraries that require, that make magic happen based on string values, but ML.NET does do that. This column name right here is required. You can't name it anything else. If you try, you'll get an exception at runtime. This is how you tell ML.NET that in the data view that it produces for output when you ask it to do a prediction, that data view has a column in it named score. This is how you tell it to map that score column to this field in this output class. Now, once I've done that, I've defined what my input and my output look like. Here's the code that builds, trains, and then uh, executes the model. I start by newing up an ML context object. That's the first line of code in every uh, ML.NET app. Remember, ML context gives you access to all the other APIs. It also gives you the option of specifying a value to see the random number generator. That may look pretty innocent, but let me tell you why they did that. With some very popular Python libraries like Keras, you can train the same model 10 times with the same data set and you will get 10 different results because internally those libraries are using oftentimes not one but several random number generators. Um, it's not obvious in Keras how to go in and fix that. If you go to Stack Overflow, you can pull out 10 lines of code that'll do it. But ML.NET makes it really easy. If you want the random number generator that it uses internally to be seeded the same every time, you specify that with the email context object. Now you will get predictable and consistent results. After that, I load, my, I load a data frame, create a data frame using load from text file, pointing it to this data file, pacificheights.cv, that I showed you just a moment ago. Now, I don't have a separate training set and test set here, so I need them. So I call train test split, do an 80-20 split on the data. I'll train it with 80% of the data, and I'll test it with 20. And because the data set has a column named use code, which specifies what type of dwelling this is. Is it a condominium? Is it a standalone home? Uh, is it an apartment or something else? Because those are categorical values, I need to one-hot encode those so that they become numbers and they can be used to train a machine learning model. So I do exactly what I showed you how to do in the, in the slide. I ask ML.NET to take that use code column and to expand it into a set of columns that will be the number of those columns will be equal to the number of unique values in that original use code column. Then I, do the, I make the call to concatenate. I say the features in this model are going to be these. I list all of the columns in my data view that I want it, uh, to use to train the model. And then I choose fast forest as my learning algorithm here. And when I do fit, that's when the model is actually trained. Now, we'll run this thing in just a moment. In fact, let's go ahead and run it. Because there are only, what, 400 and something um, uh, rows in this data, data set, it trains very quickly. 
Uh, looks like it trained with an R-squared score of 0.74, which is so, so not too bad. Interesting, the cross-validated R-squared score is lower, so in fact, by uh, not doing cross-validation, we're getting an inaccurate depiction of the accuracy of the model. But when I, actually did, when I asked it to produce a price based on the value I pulled out of the data set, it actually came reasonably close to predicting what that price would be. Now, Again, that call to fit executed quickly because the data set is small. But how did we do the evaluation and how did we do the prediction? Well, to do the evaluation, I simply used the evaluate method called through my ML context, just like you saw on the slide. I chose to use the R squared score as my key metric. That's the one, remember, that uh, is a value from zero to one, uh, the, a higher value telling you the model is more accurate. Then I used the cross-validate method to get a more accurate uh, picture of how accurate the model is. You saw that it was actually a little bit less. Here's how I do the prediction. I haven't shown you this in the slides. Once you have built and trained the model and hopefully validated it or evaluated it, to use it uh, to make predictions, you call ML.NET's create prediction engine method here. You tell it what the shape of the data is that you're going to input to it and what the shape of the data is that you want as output. So in this case, I create an input uh, class instance. Um, I assign some values to the various properties in it, and then I call predict on the prediction engine returned by create prediction engine. This pattern is common throughout ML.NET. Once you've built and trained the model, you call create prediction engine on it. Now you can do these predictions all day long. So those are the basics of ML.NET. And some of the important things that we learned here are we have strong typing so that we can specify uh, the shape of the data that we use to train the model and the shape of the data that we're going to get out of the model. In this case, because it's a regression model, we're looking for a floating point value, which we call price, uh, which is going to come from the last sold, column, last sold price column in the data set because we attributed it as the label column in the input class. Then up here, we created an ML context object. We created a data view from the CSV file containing the data. We used train test split to do an 80-20 split uh, on the data because the data in this case did contain categorical values specifying what type of dwelling it is. Uh, we one hot encoded those values. With the concatenate method, we told ML.NET that we want to use all of these columns from the data view to train the model with, then we applied the fast forest learning algorithm to it. Finally, when we call fit, that's when the model is actually trained. Now, let's move on just a little bit. Those are the basics, but there's more that you should know about if you're going to use this to build machine learning models. Regression models are designed to produce a numeric output. But perhaps more common than regression models in machine learning are classification models. Classification models' job is to take in input and classify it uh, on output. Common example, look at an email, determine whether or not it's spam. We look at the email, we say it is spam or it is not spam. That's called a binary classification problem because there are only two possible classes or two possible outcomes. Another example, optical character recognition, one of the early applications of machine learning about 20 years ago. There we do something called multi-class classification where we have uh, as many different possible classes or outcomes as there are different characters that we're going to recognize um, and we'll apply a slightly different learning algorithm for doing that. Not surprisingly, ML.NET builds in a number of different popular algorithms for doing binary classification. I've listed here the classes from ML.NET that encapsulate the binary classification training algorithms or learning algorithms. And I'll show you a couple of these in just a moment. It is just as important once you've trained a classification model to evaluate it, to score it, as it is a regression model, or else, again, you have no idea whether that model is actually able to do what you want it to do. For a classification model, there's an entirely different set of metrics that data scientists use to gauge the accuracy of the model. There's no such thing as an R-squared 
score or a mean squared error for a classification model, there are things like um, F1 scores, AUC, area under curve scores, confusion matrices. Bottom line, all of the different ways that data scientists have for evaluating the accuracy of binary classification models are just one line of code away for you. You call evaluate on the model just like you did for the regression model and then um, you get back an object containing properties whose names reflect all of the different metrics that data scientists use to evaluate the accuracy of those models. And guess what? <clears throat> just as you can call cross-validate to do a k-fold cross-validation on a regression model, you can call cross-validate on a binary classification model as well. Once more, you get back an object with properties that reflect all the different metrics that data scientists use to evaluate these things. Now, before I show you an example or two, there's something else I need to prepare you for. I mentioned a few minutes ago that um, machine learning models can only deal with numbers. They have no idea what to do with text. One common example of when we encounter text in a data set is when that text represents categorical values, like the type of a dog or the make of a car. But there's another one as well. Sometimes the data set contains raw text. For example, if we're going to use machine learning to do spam classification, we have to somehow take all of those emails, the text of those emails that we're training the model with, and vectorize them. They have to become ones and zeros. One hot encoding doesn't help us there. One hot encoding helps us when we have text that represents categorical values. If we want to deal with raw text in a machine learning model, the typical way we do it is we put the, the text through a process called vectorization. Vectorization involves a number of things. Typically, you convert all the text to lowercase. You remove stop words that are insignificant, words like the and that and things like that. But there's more. We then turn the raw text into a table of zeros and ones by basically creating a, a data view that has one column for every unique word or combination of words, if we choose, in that, uh, in that corpus of text we're training with. That vectorized text ends up becoming an oftentimes massive table of ones and zeros. If there are 50,000 different unique words in the text, there will be 50,000 different columns, uh, each filled with ones and zeros in the data set. And if there are one million emails we're training it with, not only will there be 50,000 columns, there will be one million rows as well. That may sound intimidating, but actually that's not, I mean, for a computer, that's not that much, right? The good news is ML.net has a method named Featureized Text that will just take a bunch of text and do all of this for you. It actually applies nine different transforms internally, transforms that you have to apply manually in most other libraries. It just does it, and it makes it really easy to build models, especially classification models, that do things like spam classification um, and other things. Let me show you a couple of examples here. Let's go back out to... Uh, these examples here. And let's start with sentiment analysis. So if you've been around ML for a little while, you know that there's certain problems that have been solved and solved very well. Doing sentiment analysis on text is one of them. Looking at, at, at a movie review or a review of a product that your company sells, for example, and coming up with a number from zero to one representing uh, whether that, that, that that sentence or paragraph or whatever represents negative sentiment or positive sentiment. Uh, my son is a data scientist. He finished grad school a year and a half ago. Uh, right before he graduated, the summer before he graduated, he was working for a company that sells pet products worldwide. And one of the first assignments they gave him was to build a sentiment analysis model so that their marketing department could get a heads up from the computer if people were tweeting negative things about the company or its products uh, on Twitter. So the good news is sentiment analysis is something that's pretty easy to do today. Let me show you what I did. I first started with a public data set that comes from Yelp. Uh, this is a fairly small data set. It would be more accurate if I had more of them. I took 1,000 reviews from Yelp. 
Um, and someone else had already helpfully classified each of them as a one, meaning it's a positive comment, or a zero, meaning it's a negative comment. So we're going to build a binary classification model here so that when we feed in the next text string, it'll give us a number, it'll tell us whether it's a zero or a one. It'll also tell us the probability that it's a one, which can be used as a zero to one sentiment uh, score for that piece of text. So in the model here, nothing really you haven't seen before. We create an ML context object. We load a data view from that TSV file. We do a train test split to split it into a training set and a test set. What is new is that we then call ML.NET's handy featureized text method. This is the one that creates that massive data set that has um, one column for every unique word in the corpus of text that we feed into it. Then, I'm using fast tree here again. Uh, this is actually a fast tree classifier, not a fast tree regressor. I played around with different, with different learning algorithms, and I found this one uh, gave reasonably good results, so I, I went with it. Here we do the fit. Um, this is where we train the model. We do an evaluation. We, also, we do a better evaluation using cross-validation here. Then, we test the thing out. I, I call create prediction engine so that I can use this model to make predictions. And I feed into it some sample reviews that I wrote up here just to see how this model scores it. Now remember the goal here is for each text string I feed in, I want it to give me a value from zero to one with zero indicating very negative sentiment, one being very positive. Let's train this model and see what it does with those five inputs that I gave it. So you can see the results there. The food was great and the service was excellent scored a .996, that's a pretty positive review. I wouldn't let my dog eat here, scored a 0 0.01, clearly a very negative comment. This is how we build sentiment analysis models. I can do this with other libraries like Scikit. No, no library trains faster or does it better, in my opinion, than ML.NET. And by the way, did I say I get to do it in C Sharp also? Isn't that great? Um, here's another example, binary classification. I'll just look at it really quickly here because, again, I'll uh, let you go to GitHub and download these samples. Um, spam detection. So here's a model that um, looks at emails and tells you whether they're spam or not. Uh, this one actually takes a little bit longer to train and to cross-validate, so I won't run it. But there's nothing you haven't seen here before. Um, the data set is this one. It's interesting. One of the reasons ML and AI are taking off so much is because we have a lot more data available to us now than we did five years ago or 10 years ago. Um, fifth, 10 or 15 years ago, there was a big scandal in the, in the US, the Enron scandal. Have any of you heard of it? It was a company that went bust. Some of the, uh, the executives that led the company went to jail. After all was said and done, all of those, that company's millions and millions of emails became the property of the U.S. government who published them as a public data set. And researchers at various universities went through the laborious process of reading each and every email and labeling it with a one or a zero, saying it's spam or it's not spam. Because they've done that hard work, I can now use that data set to train a very accurate spam detection model. By the way, that's not the only public domain spam training data set out there. There are several of them. You can see right here um, a little bit about what this data set looks like. So again, I won't run it, but I do use a different algorithm here uh, because when I tried various algorithms uh, and seemed to get the best results with this one, but it's pretty cool because once the model is trained, once it's all said and done, I take these sample emails here and feed them in and this one right here, why pay more for expensive meds when you can order them online and save dollar, dollar, dollar? That one scores like a .01. So you'll find if you run this, it is very, very good at detecting spam. By the way, this also was one of the earliest applications of machine learning 20 years ago. Before machine learning came along, when we tried to use rule-based systems to do spam identification, those systems were easy to defeat. It's much, much, much harder to, to beat a spam detection model that's built with machine learning. So we only have five minutes. Let's go back here and see if we can go a little bit further. <clears throat> Do you like what you see so far, by the way? 
so much cleaner than Python. And the cool thing is, in fact, let me just go right on to something that will actually set the stage for a talk that's being done tomorrow um, that uh, is going to be super cool. So I do have some slides on multi-class trainers. I've got an example in my GitHub repo um, uh, of how to use a multi-class classification trainer in ML.NET to do optical character recognition, but it's fairly self-explanatory. Multi-class classification is just binary classification with more possibilities. Let me tell you about this. One of the things that makes ML and AI really, really cool today is advances that have been made in computer vision. Let's say you work at a, at a company that produces physical goods, produces machine parts, and you are asked to build a software system that looks at a photo taken of each part coming off the assembly line and indicates whether the part is defective or not. 20 years ago, it was next to impossible to do. 10 years ago, it was difficult. Today, that problem has been solved thanks to advances in image classification. Image classification is a process by which a computer or an ML model actually looks at an image and identifies objects in it, identifies faces in it, tells you whether the image uh, contains a flower or whether it does not or what have you. Now, most, in fact, the vast majority of image classification models are actually neural networks. They're a special type of neural network called a convolutional neural network. Um, I won't go into the details on it because I believe that uh, uh, that's going to be covered in the talk tomorrow, but, but let me tell you this. Here's the problem with image classification. Let's say, let's say your manager does ask you to build that ML model that will look at parts coming off an assembly line and tell you whether the part is defective or not. The technology is there. Training that model is impractical unless you have access to a very large and very expensive HPC cluster equipped with GPUs. One of the reasons that data scientists and Microsoft Research and Facebook and elsewhere can build these super sophisticated image recognition models is because they do have access to clusters with thousands of nodes in them equipped with NVIDIA GPUs so they can do massive parallel processing. For you to train a neural network to say whether that uh, photo that you feed in contains a defective part or whether it contains a slice of pizza or a hot dog is computationally infeasible unless you want to pay the Azure or AWS fees to go do that. But thanks to something called transfer learning, we can actually do it. Companies like Microsoft and Google and Facebook have already built super sophisticated convolutional neural networks for us, generally using TensorFlow, and they've published them uh, on GitHub. Now these Serialized models are typically pretty large, typically 50 to 100 megabytes. But transfer learning allows us to take a network, a neural network that has already been trained by one of the tech giants, strip off the classification layers at the end, and repurpose it for our uses. In other words, we can take the results of what they did on um, you know, a very expensive Azure HPC cluster, we can essentially retrain that network with 50 to 100 images of our own and often get more than 90% accuracy. Now, their scikit won't do this. Keras will do it, but it's horrific. ML.NET, and this is one of the features no one talks about, ML.NET does not let you build neural nets from scratch. It may someday, but it doesn't today. It does let you take pre-trained neural networks from people like Microsoft and Google and repurpose them for your own uses. Now, let me just show you an example here, and then we will close out, and I will give you the uh, URL where you can go and download this. In the US, there's a popular TV show called Silicon Valley. It's an HBO show. Do any of you watch that? So a couple of years ago, do you remember, um, there was an episode where the guys on the show built an app called the Not Hot Dog app. Do you remember that? They could take a picture of a, of uh, a plate of food with their phone, and the app would tell them whether that was a hot dog or not. Now, as simple as that sounds, that is a very sophisticated image classification problem. Ten years ago, we couldn't have done it. Today, it's easy to do. What I've done is I took a model, a neural network, a convolutional neural network, built by Google and posted on GitHub. It's about 50 megabytes serialized size. And I used a little-known class in ML.NET called TensorFlow Model to load that model, retrain it 
with about 20 of my own images so it can tell me whether an image contains a hot dog or not. Then I built a little WPF app that uses that model. Um, and we should be able to run it and see if it actually works. I mean, for all you know, I could be making all this up, right? Uh, there is a, a, an entire talk dedicated to just this topic tomorrow, by the way. So here's what this WPF app looks like. We'll let it start up here. Now, what you can't see is that after I trained or repurposed Google's model, it's called the Inception model, once I retrained it to recognize whether an image contains a hot dog or not, I called the save method on it, which wrote a zip file out to my hard disk with the saved ml.net model. So that I don't have to go through all the training time every time this app runs, there's a couple lines of code at the beginning that loads that already trained model from the zip file. Then it calls create prediction engine so it can use it to do predictions. So in the WPF app, I've already loaded up that model. I'll select an image. Here's an image of a burger. It's now passing it off to the model, and the model tells me, nope, it's not a hot dog. I went and grabbed some other random images off the internet. Here's one that clearly is a hot dog. My model tells me it is a hot dog. Again, this kind of problem that was next to impossible a few years ago is one that has been well figured out. Without transfer learning, it's not practical for you and I to train these sophisticated neural networks to do this sort of thing. But one of the features of ML.net, one that's not getting talked about, yeah, is, I think that means that our session time is up. Um, but one of the features of ML.net that's not talked about a lot is it makes it easier than any other library out there to take these pre-trained deep neural networks built by the tech giants and repurpose them to do whatever you want them to do. The sample code is there. Let me give you the URL so that if you want to download these examples and more and play with them, you may do that. It's a public repo. Uh, I am uh, uh, occasionally go back and refine code there or add new um, samples. So keep your eye on it. GitHub.com, JeffProsci slash ML.net. Feel free to uh, download the code, play with it, share it with your friends, and make ML and AI magic happen. Thank you so much.